classes on European women and gender, and you'll see some of the influence of that in my lecture today. I'm also the director of the graduate studies program for the Department of History at Sac State, and I'm super pleased to see a number of graduate students in the audience. And we are always looking for more graduate students for our program, and you're never too old. I think, uh, I think the oldest graduate since I was, I've been graduate director for, for nine years, and we had, we had helped one student finish up, who I think was 76 when he finished. So if you're interested in that, don't hesitate to talk to me. Um, and so yeah, I chose a modest topic for my talk here, how the Great War changed the world. I hope you have all day. Um, the reason actually that I decided to take this approach to talking about the war has to do with the challenge that I face in the classroom when I go to teach about World War I to my undergraduate students. Um, most of them enter my classroom knowing that World War I existed, primarily because there was a World War II that followed it. <laughs> and so they, they enter convinced, in part perhaps from their high school experience, or from the History Channel, or I don't know where, that World War II changed the world. <coughs> and that really most of the major political, economic, cultural, what have you, developments that were meaningful and lasted over time stem from World War II. And in part because I like to shake up my students' preconceived notions about the world, and in part because as a historian of World War I, I'm convinced that many of the important changes that came out of World War II actually began in World War I. I frame my discussion of World War I with them as uh, an examination, really, of all the many ways that World War I changed the world. Um, now, there's a lot of ways that I could have framed this talk today that I didn't. Um, I could have spent my afternoon with you talking about military changes stemming from the war. And, of course, because of the destructive power of modern weaponry that was either utilized on a large scale for the first time, like the machine gun, or that was introduced over the course of World War I for the first time, including the use of poison gas, which was introduced initially by the Germans and then utilized by both forces in the war. There's one um, photograph on the screen showing just part of the destructive capacity of, of, of gas used in the war, um, the introduction of air technology and air power in warfare, initially for reconnaissance, but also both with um, dirigibles and also airplanes, eventually dropping bombs and mounted with machine guns, fighting air duels in the sky. And then in response to the destruction of this new weaponry, the invention of the tank, which really only first was utilized to any of effectiveness in the last year of the war in World War I. Um, so there are many ways that World War I was shaped by and then reshaped military technology and its destructive capacity, of course, resulting in the long, drawn out, incredibly bloody war that World War I became. Um, but I'm not going to talk about military change today. I think actually one of the future talks in this series is going to focus on that with you. I was very tempted to talk about political change stemming from this war and the peace treaties that followed it, um, which was extraordinary both for Europe and worldwide. The First World War, of course, destroyed four major Eurasian empires. Um, beginning in the East, it brought about the destruction of the Russian Empire, which had been in place ever since the late Middle Ages resulting in part from the destruction of the war itself and also, of course, the revolution in 1917 that brought down the Tsar and brought into place the world's first <coughs> communist government under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin, who's up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen as you're looking at it. Um, so in many respects and in ways I don't have time to get into today, we can see the origins of the Cold War already um, in 1917 and in the Civil War that followed, in which the Americans actually fought to help try and bring down the Red Army um, unsuccessfully and, um, and to great effect for the remainder of the 20th century. Uh, World War I also destroyed the Ottoman Empire down in the southeast there. 
uh, bringing into being the first modern state of Turkey, led by Ataturk, whose picture is also up there on the screen, um, who helped establish Turkey as an um, independent and secular state, but also, of course, bringing about the destruction of the remainder of the Ottoman Empire, including the establishment of new mandates or pseudo-colonies in the Middle East, in Syria, in Palestine, and one can see many of the original roots of the Middle East crisis and some of the decisions that were made at the end of World War War World War One. Excuse me. Here today, also the um, reconstruction of Central Europe, both due to the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, but also the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You have Admiral Horthy, who would become the conservative, militaristic, and eventually pro-Nazi ruler of the new state of Austria, but also the establishment of the new states of Czechoslovakia, um, Yugoslavia, bringing together the Serbs, who in many respects were at the heart at the beginning of this war, um, shaped into a new South Slav Union there. And then finally, also the destruction of the German Empire. They lost their territories overseas. The Germans lost some of their territory in Europe. And while many, many Germans were never convinced that they had been defeated on the battlefield, they had a lot of trouble swallowing the terms of this particular treaty. Among them, of course, Adolf Hitler, who's pictured as a soldier in World War I. Um, it's kind of a small picture there on the um, far left of the screen. So in many respects, one can trace the origins of the rise of Nazism, of authoritarianism in Central Europe, of communism, of the Cold War, of the Middle East crisis, all of these to World War I and its finale as well. Um, but that's not what I'm gonna to talk to you about today either. <laughs> uh, finally, I have to say a word about cultural change for those of you who were here listening to my colleague Erin Cohen speak last week on art during World War I. Um, for good reason, many people talk about World War I, 1914 as a break in European mentality and globally, in many respects, destroying the kind of innocence, the faith in progress, the faith in science and technology that had defined the ascendancy of Europe and North America in the years up to World War I, and talk about a real new bitterness and harsh realism and um, disillusionment with rationality that came out of the war that is very prominent in much of the literature of the period, in the painting as well, stemming from new objectivism in Germany to surrealism in Paris and elsewhere. And um, René Magritte is one of my favorite surrealist artists, so I put his painting up there as a representation of this new broader mentality coming out of the war as well. Um, what I do want to try and talk to you today is in some respects an agglomeration of the political history, the military history, the cultural history, and the social history of this war. But I want to focus on major important um, individuals caught up in this conflict who weren't the soldiers in the trenches or down at Gallipoli or elsewhere caught up in the fighting, or at least not the European soldiers that have garnered so much of our attention. And instead, I want to focus to some degree on the fringes, although I want to convince you that the fringes are in fact at the very center of what was going on, and talk about colonial subjects who fought in this war or who came and supported the war through um, agricultural or industrial labor for the varying forces, and uh, also look at women and their role in the war and the effects of the war on gender relations, particularly in the West. So returning to this idea that um, so many of us, Americans I think in particular, tend to see World War II as the event that um, generated so much important change for the remainder of the 20th century and up through today, um, I put these two pictures on the screen. I guess I'll ask all of you first of all, does anyone know who we're looking at on the left-hand side of the screen there? Ho Chi, Ho Chi Minh, right. That's a picture of Ho Chi Minh taken in 1946. Um, so it's a picture that was taken just a year after the end of World War II when Ho Chi Minh issued his Declaration of Independence for the People of Vietnam, a document 
that mirrors the American Declaration of Independence and that Ho Chi Minh had fully expected the Americans to endorse because, of course, he had aided them in helping fight the Japanese over the course of World War II. Um, but I use Ho Chi Minh as representative of the forces of decolonization that followed from the end of World War II. And then who are we looking at on the other side of the screen? Rosie, Rosie the Riveter, right? The kind of not real but emblematic female munitions worker, um, this, the most famous recruitment poster from the United States from World War II, that again, I think when my students look at it, they say, okay, well, that's because women left the home for the first time in World War II. And this is, you know, in fact, what liberated them for the remainder of the 20th century. So I'm gonna have a step back and instead look 30 years earlier at World War I that's Ho Chi Minh in the early 1920s, just a couple years after he issued a letter to the, peace, to the major leaders at the Paris Peace Conference requesting the liberation of the Vietnamese people. And that is a British recruitment poster for female munitions workers over the course of World War I. And so I'm going to look at both race and gender with you today and talk about the way that World War I forever challenged prevailing racial hierarchies and gender, hi gender hierarchies, including the institution of patriarchy in Europe and to some degree around the world. So that's what I am going to talk about today. I'm very bad about long introductions, but <laughs> now you know. So World War I, of course, was not a war just among nations. It was a war among empires. And the European states in particular, France and Britain and Belgium and Germany, were all major global rulers when this war broke out. They had acquired much of their territory in the late 19th and early 20th century in the scramble for territory in Africa, also in particularly in South Asia. And while World War I was not caused um, uh, the outbreak was not directly related to global conflict. As soon as this war broke out, colonial ambitions and colonial status became very important to the eventual outcome of the war and to the ambitions that many of the powers brought with them. Both the Ottoman Empire, which broke apart, and the German Empire, which broke apart at the end of the war, um, lost important territories and colonial holdings. And the map here is showing you particularly um, clearly the German holdings in Africa, both in West Africa, Southeast and Southwest Africa, that were fought over um, over the course of the war in which Germany eventually lost. I want to say, you know, state up front, um, if you don't know, that those colonial holdings that Germany lost were divided up when the war was over among the colonial powers for, between France and Britain in particular, Belgium got its peace as did South Africa as an um, independent state as well. So in the short run, World War I did not destroy the era of imperialism. If anything, in the short run, it breathed another 30 years of life into colonialism, in part because France and Britain were so determined to um, to make a prop, not make a profit, but to benefit from the new acquisitions that they gained over the course of the war. Um, so World War I did not destroy empire or colonialism as an institution. What World War I did, I want to argue today, is it destroyed the mystique of white civilization among colonial subjects. The European powers had done their utmost to convince their colonial subjects that the reason that they were in power over them and had been for 20, 30, 40, sometimes 100 more years is because they had the superior civilization. And because even looking at uh, reigning ideas of evolution and the uses of Charles Darwin's ideas, that in fact, white supremacy was based on white superiority. And it's not that all colonized subjects just bought that hook, line, and sinker. But in the midst of World War I and through the experience of World War I, they learned to question that in very important and meaningful ways that would have lasting repercussions over the course of the war. And that's what I want to examine um, a little closer up here today. <clears throat> 
So the decision to utilize um, the manpower of the colonies was not an easy one for the various powers to make, and not all of them decided to do so at all. When World War I broke out, Germany pleaded with all the other imperial powers to leave the colonies out of it, um, to make the colonies neutral. And Germany was adamant that it would be a terrible mistake to arm black men against white men anywhere in the context of this war. And so the Germans made the decision very early on not to attempt to utilize their African subjects in Europe. Now, when push came to shove, the Germans actually lost most of their African colonies very early in the fighting. Um, and so they were not particularly in a position to draw on that manpower. They did arm Africans in fighting other African colonial armies, but they never brought imperial subjects to Europe to fight. The British took a different tack, at least initially. Um, when the British entered the war, they were alone among the major powers and that they did not have a draft. They relied on a voluntary army for the first year and a half of the war. And for that reason, they had concerns about manpower very early on as well. One of the sources that they had to draw from was the British Indian Army, the colonial army in Britain that was close to 150,000 men strong, that was highly trained, and that they saw as a force to utilize from the earliest um, uh, months of the war. And so they made the decision to bring Indian troops over to Europe. Um, the first Indian troops arrived in Europe in November of 1914, so just a couple months into the conflict. And over the entirety of the war, infantry and cavalry, there were 138,000 Indian troops that participated in fighting in, on the Western Front. Um, most that came over to fight never saw India again. Most, um, the vast majority died um, in the early year of the war. Um, so these troops were of high value to the British Expeditionary Force and to the Entente powers more generally, but the British could never quite reconcile themselves to their Indian forces being there. They were deeply concerned about the costs of too much close contact between these Indian soldiers and either fellow white soldiers or the civilian populations to which they would um, be acclimated. And they worried as well about nationalist sentiment growing among the soldiers that they brought to Europe. Um, like every other major army, they regularly censored the mail going back and forth in Europe as well, but also between India and Europe. And they found statements like the one up on the screen there that was sent home in 1916 by an Indian cavalryman, where he said, if we Indians bring back to India the flag of victory, which we have helped win for our King George, we shall have proved our fitness and will be entitled to self-government. So this notion that they were fighting for the victory of the empire, for the liberty of Britain, entitled them in some ways to their own liberty when the war was over, was obviously deeply disconcerting for British imperial authorities. So much so that in the winter of 1915, the British government made the decision to send all the Indian infantry that remained back home. So only a relatively small number of cavalrymen from India remained on the Western Front um, to the end of the war. They did continue to use Indian troops fairly broadly for fighting in the Middle East, but to them, the Turks were only semi-civilized to begin with. So using colonial subjects against the Turks fit in the racial hierarchy in a way that it, it didn't when it came to fighting white forces in Europe. Um, when it came to fighting, uh, when it came to their African subjects, and of course the British had vast holdings in East Africa and South Africa, like the Germans, the British made the decision not to utilize African soldiers in Europe. The, um, again, the idea of arming black men against white men just um, settled too, with too much difficulty for them. They could not bring themselves to make that decision. They used their African forces relatively wide, uh, widely fighting against the Germans in Africa itself. Although um, I think one of the very tragic and, and forgotten victims of this war is less the African soldiers who fought in these battles, 
but the porters that the um, British, like every other major colonial troop, utilized to support their forces. There were, for the fighting in Africa, there were two to three porters for every soldier who fought. Um, depending on the length of the campaign, they carried 60 pound packs and sometimes they needed to carry them for two to three weeks at a time. Um, it's estimated that the British alone used nearly a million carriers or porters just in its East African campaign. This was one of the most deadly occupations that you could have over the course of World War I. Um, again, military historians can only estimate, but it seems that approximately 20% of all of the British, um, uh, all of the Africans used as porters by the British died over the course of the war. A 20% death rate, that was higher than it was for British soldiers fighting on the Western Front. Or to give you another idea, in the East African campaign, British battle losses titled, um, totaled about 3,400 men. Um, in that same campaign, about 90,000 porters lost their lives. That was primarily from disease and nutrition because they were barely fat enough to keep them alive. Um, so the colonial subjects of British Africa, while they did not see fighting on the Western Front, paid very, very dearly uh, with their lives, depending on what part of British Africa. Um, it could have a severe depletion of the local population, and there were all kinds of repercussions that came from that. Um, so when it came to the British Empire stretching from Africa across to India, the colonial soldiers, colonial subjects paid a very heavy price, um, but it did not really shake the British belief in racial hierarchy, in white privilege, and despite the fact that the subjects of the empire were so vital um, to the eventual outcome of the war, they were not particularly rewarded for their efforts. That said, we can see very real consequences for the British Empire in particular, so I'll just point to two of them. The first is probably better, slightly better known. Um, World War I helped spur the Indian nationalist movement, which was already very real and organized prior to the war. It spurred it to move from a program of seeking more rights for Indians within the context of the British Empire to demanding home rule or self-governance. Um, and World War I was a key turning point here. Gandhi returned to India from South Africa in the middle of World War I and would eventually, after the war, take over the leadership of the Indian National Congress. Um, but in 1916, the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League met together in Lucknow and signed a pact known as the Lucknow Pact, which was the first time that they demanded home rule or self-governance from the British government. And while it would take another 30, 40 years to get there, the dynamism and the importance of the Indian nationalist movement um, under Gandhi's leadership in the 1920s and 30s very much originated in the midst of World War I. Um, other uh, repercussions are perhaps a little bit harder to see, but for those who've researched this topic in depth, one sees hints of it all over the place, including this 1919 um, memo. This actually came from the British Caribbean. The British did use a um, fair number of Caribbean soldiers, Jamaica, Trinidad, in the fighting. And um, this memo came um, discussing soldiers returning home to the Caribbean afterwards, saying, nothing we can do will alter the fact that the black man has begun to think and feel himself as good as white. So this experience for colonial soldiers who did fight in World War I changed how they looked at themselves, changed how that they looked at the empire, and eventually changed how, how they looked at the political future of their world um, as well. When it comes to the utilization of colonial subjects in the war, France was in a league by itself. Um, France, for various reasons, did not have the same hesitations that the Germans had, that the British had, and from the very earliest years of the war, very earliest months, days even, of the war, um, planned out a strategy that would draw very, very heavily from the manpower resources of its colonies. 
It's important to remember that France demographically was severely disadvantaged compared to Germany. Germany had a much larger population to draw from for its army and its resources, and the French were very, very aware of that and worried about that. And of course, the vast majority of the fighting on the Western Front took place on French soil. Um, with the exception of Serbia, the French suffered more losses per percentage of the population than any other nation that fought in World War I. And in part, it was this concern over manpower issues that led the French to look to their colonies. Um, the very first French West African soldiers brought up, uh, were called forth from West Africa and transported to Europe. Um, the call to, for that transport was made on August 4th. So essentially as soon as the war broke out. And those first soldiers saw their first fighting three weeks later. Um, the forces from French West Africa were referred to as tirailleurs Senegalais. So tirailleur um, kind of means sharpshooter. Uh, Senegalais from the region of Senegal. But when they use that term, they're not talking just about modern day Senegal. That was a general term for all the soldiers coming from West Africa. Um, as the French justify to themselves, to their colonial subjects, and to the world, their reasons for pursuing this strategy, they argued and they deeply believed that in many respects their colonial subjects owed military service to them because of the benefits that had brought, been brought to them by the empire itself. The French, like the British, like the um, Germans and Belgians, believed very, very firmly that they were engaging in a civilizing mission throughout the empire, in Africa and elsewhere. And so when they thought about whether or not to draw upon these manpower resources, they said, well, we brought a lot to our colonial subjects. Now it's their time to repay their mother country in turn. Um, so an example, although there's thousands out there, um, is this memo that was issued by General Charles Mangin, one of the um, generals in World War I, who argued, we have the right to call on the aid of our colonial subjects. We have brought to our colonies prosperity and peace. We have delivered them from epidemics, raids, periodic famines, and civil wars. Today we struggle for them as well as for us. The yoke of the invaders, they know it, would weigh as heavily, more heavily on them than on us. We have the right to call on our colonies, and we have the duty. So it was a justification, but it was a very heartfelt justification that their colonial subjects were in it with them. And, um, and so they drew, as I said, very, very broadly. In total, French, the French recruited about half a million colonial soldiers to fight in Europe and the Middle East over the course of the war. And they drew on hundreds and thousands more colonial subjects to come over and serve as agricultural laborers and industrial laborers in Europe over the course of the war as well. Um, they argued particularly that the West Africans and North Africans were valuable as fierce fighters. They had a reputation as warriors. Uh, in their more frank moments, the French also admitted that they were fairly useful cannon fodder and that it was, more it was preferable to shed African blood or Indian, uh, Vietnamese blood than it was white blood. And that shows up in some of the decision making um, as well. So the French, um, uh, as I said, utilized these soldiers. They took part in many of the major battles on the Western Front. And um, they were valuable as soldiers to the French army. One of the things that was extremely unique in this circumstance, though, is that while the French were not going to elevate any colonial subject super high up the military ranks, they were willing to move them up the ranks of non-commissioned officers. And this meant that there were French African officers that found themselves in positions of authority over white soldiers. And the French army insisted that those white soldiers salute their African superiors, that it obey any orders that they give. And that was extremely controversial, um, but it was supported throughout the war by the French army. And that experience was very, um, uh, very unique. Also unique in the African case is that some of these colonial soldiers were able to leverage their military presence for citizenship. 
And this had a lot to do with the efforts of the man on the screen there, a man by the name of Blaise Diagne, uh, who was from West Africa. He was from a very small part of West Africa that had been conquered very early by the French and had special status that other parts of the empire did not. And because of this, he was able to be elected in February 1914 to the French National Assembly. So he was the first, and at this point in time, the only black man serving in the National Assembly in France over the course of the war. And when the war broke out, he, had, he was enormously popular back in, um, in West Africa. And when the war broke out, the French military officials called him in and said, we need to recruit tens and thousands of African soldiers to fight in the war, will you help us? And he initially, he essentially responded by saying yes. He was very assimilated. He was a very patriotic Frenchman. Um, he said yes, but I don't want them called up as mercenaries. Most of these colonial subjects served, and they were given a small ba pay bonus, so the money was, the families were paid off. Um, but they weren't conscripted on the same terms as Europeans were. He said, I want the Africans in my district to be conscripted to have the same military service responsibilities as Europeans do, but at the same time, they and their families should have the full rights of French citizenship. And in July of 1916, the National Assembly agreed, and they passed a bill known as the Diania Law, which granted full rights of citizenship to these African soldiers from just from this particular region of West Africa. It affected approximately seven or 8,000 men and their families, um, that particular law. Um, so that too was an important concession, even if the French throughout the empire stopped far short of full um, emancipation or imagining equality. When the war was over, French colonial subjects, um, along with others from around the world, um, particularly the elite and educated leaders among them, were very aware that they were looking at a unique moment to pursue the possibility of independence and self-sovereignty. Of course, President Wilson in the Paris peace negotiations had um, opened up the idea that national self-determination should guide the restructuring of maps around the world and Africans, and in this case, um, Vietnamese from French into China, took President Wilson and others at their word. At their word. Um, Les Diagne, um, along with other African leaders, and W.E.B. Du Bois from the United States, planned their own conference in Paris, coinciding with the Paris Peace Conference, and it is the Pan-African Conference of 1919. Um, there were 60 delegates in attendance, many from America and Britain ultimately couldn't come because their governments denied them visas. But nonetheless, those that attended put forward a demand for the gradual emancipation of the peoples of Africa, based in part on the experience of World War I. And then back to our friend Ho Chi Minh here. Ho Chi Minh in 1919 was where, working as a busboy at a restaurant in a Parisian hotel. And how he had the audacity, I will never know, but he drew up an incredibly eloquent letter, and he sent it to Wilson and Clemenceau and Lloyd George, and in it, he demanded the um, self-governance in Vietnam, or for the Annamite people, which was the ethnic name for the people of Vietnam. Um, the letter opened, since the victory of the Allies, all the subject peoples are frantic with hope at the prospect of an era of right and justice, which should begin for them by virtue of the formal and solemn engagements made before the whole world by the various powers of the Entente in the struggle of civilization against barbarism. And he attempted to leverage this experience in order to demand liberation for the Vietnamese people. His letter was never answered. And Ho Chi Minh went on the next year, in 1920, in helping found the French Communist Party in Paris later traveled to China, and eventually returned home and helped form the Vietnamese Communist Party for all the consequences that followed for the remainder of the 20th century. One of the many reasons why Europeans were so uncomfortable at the idea of bringing colonial subjects over to Europe to fight, whether they were Indian, Indo-Chinese, African, um, was the fear that they had of contact between men and white women. 
This was a very real, very concrete fear that colonial subjects and white women would develop intimate relations of some kind or another while they were in Europe, whether it was through prostitution or because they met each other and fell in love. That was the worst case scenario possible for these colonial um, regimes. And they were concerned in part because they were afraid of the ideas that those Africans and Indians and Vietnamese would then carry back home with them where white women in the colonies were viewed as completely off limits, and intimate relations were completely taboo. Um, and so they, they looked at their mail, they censored their mail, they pulled any photographs that they were trying to send home of themselves with white women and sent them to the incinerator. Um, concerned with images like this one, actually in this postcard, which is just a French woman giving grapes to a wounded um, Senegalese soldier. And they were concerned about attitudes like the one um, described by this Tunisian official in French North Africa in 1921, where he complained, all the tirailleurs are coming back from France with the ideas clearly turned around as far as French prestige and European prestige in general are concerned. Um, so they no longer would view white women as rightfully superior to them. Um, so that was one of the real concerns there. But the other reason why this issue, the idea of colonial subjects and white women mixing in some way, shape, or form over the course of the war had to do with what the war was doing to women and ideas about gender, which is what I want to focus on for the remainder of my talk here today. In a modern war of attrition, as World War I became very, very quickly, Societies were dependent upon the entirety of their populations to win the war. It was a matter of who could hold out the longest. It wasn't just a matter of who would man the trenches. It was a matter of who would make the shells, of who would bring in the harvest and, and supply the food, and who would keep families, economy, communities going while these millions of men were off fighting for years at a time. And governments across Europe called upon women to step into male jobs and male roles in order to keep this, um, keep the economy running and keep the war effort possible. Um, women's participation, what they actually did in the war, varied greatly depending on their social class, which is probably no big surprise to any of you. Um, for relatively wealthy women or women of the middle class, there were all types of volunteer service that they could and were expected to engage in in order to support the war effort. <coughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of wealthy women became involved um, in preparing care packages by the millions for the soldiers at the front, um, in serving, um, for the, serving their governments to help um, with war bond drives, getting people to dedicate their financial resources to the war. Probably though one of the most dramatic um, uh, changes over the course of the war was the huge number of women that were drawn into the conflict as voluntary nurses. Um, this was not the first war in which women served as nurses at or near the front lines, but this was the first one where they did so in mass numbers. So that the French Red Cross, which is what the black and white photograph is of there, um, the French Red Cross alone recruited about 70,000 volunteer nurses, female nurses, to serve over the course of the war. Um, the British equivalent was the VAD, the Volunteer Aid Detachment, again supplying voluntary nurses as well as cooks and others. And these women were expected not only to volunteer their time and their lives, they were expected to provide all the resources. They came with their own uniforms, they supplied often their own bandages, um, this was part of the middle class's support of the war effort. And the British in particular were quite willing to utilize these nurses, also ambulance drivers, very, very close to the front lines um, throughout much of the war. Uh, these nurses were glorified in military propaganda. It was, they were described as fulfilling their maternal role to the boys at the front lines. Um, but they were also very disconcerting to public authorities as well, who worried about the very intimate contact that these women were having with men at the most vulnerable moment in their lives. And so there was a lot of anxiety generated by this, even as they depended on these women as well. Most women, of course, could not volunteer their time 
over a four year long war because most women had to provide for their families with millions and millions of men away um, from their families for long periods of time women's economic labor mattered more than it had in centuries and so for most women serving the war meant doing so in some sort of paid labor and this became possible because of the buildup of the war economy from 1915 forward. So in March of 1915, the British Board of Trade issued an appeal to women asking them to take, quote, paid employment of any kind in trade, commerce, or agriculture. And it added, any woman who by working helps to release and equip a man for fighting does national war service. That was a pretty remarkable statement. Not because it was asking women to do paid work. I have to drill this into my poor students' heads, not that they ever believe me. But it's not that housewives left the home and went to work for the first time. Most of these women had been working throughout the entirety of their lives. But they'd been working in very poorly paid female sectors, particularly in textiles and domestic service. And their work was not terribly valued by the societies in which they lived. Now the government was asking them to step up and do the most important thing that they could do, which was to help their nation win the war. They were told that women's labor matters. And that, in addition to the fact that most of these war jobs were better paid than anything these women had been able to do in their lives, led to a flood of women into new sectors of the economy where they had not been served before. This included ticket takers on tramways, um, clerks at banks, but most prominently, women flooded into the arms industry. They took up jobs in chemicals and they took up jobs in munitions in huge numbers. So to give you just a couple of statistics to wrap your brain about it, around it, um, by 1917, there were 700,000 women in Germany working in engineering, metallurgical, iron, steel, and chemical industries. That was six times higher than it had been the case at the beginning of the war. Or at the end of the war in France, women accounted for 25% of all metal workers nationwide, where they had constituted less than 5% before the war began. Uh, this war was dangerous. It was laborious. Women died of explosions in factories. They died or were made ill by TNT poisoning. Um, but as I said, they flooded into these industries, both out of a sense that their labor mattered and because they could make a living wage and support their families throughout the entirety of the war. For the most part, there were some limits to what these different governments were willing to consider as women's war service over the course of the war. Um, there were deep concerns that the war was, in fact, masculinizing women, and that when the war was over, women would no longer be women uh, once the war was over. Um, to give you just one quote, a government representative testified before the German parliament in 1917, saying, quote, Today, when we look at women performing the most difficult tasks, we must look closely to be sure that we are looking at a woman and not at a man. So this sense that the war was blurring gender lines was a very real concern. And the government, at the same time that it was calling on women for war service, also took steps in order to try and contain the damage of this blending of gender roles over the course of the war. Um, most importantly, with one exception, which I'll talk about in a second, all of the belligerent governments rebuffed any efforts that women made in order to join the active military. In every major um, uh, government, there were women who applied to the army, to the military, and asked to serve their nation. And in every instance, they were turned down, although a few disguised themselves as men and slipped in anyway. Um, the one exception to the rule is the one up on the screen, which is the case of Russia. In 1917, so many soldiers were abandoning their posts. Um, Russian soldiers were abandoning their posts that the government was desperate um, to man the army, but more importantly, to keep 
the soldiers in place. And so they agreed in 1917, at the request of women who came before them, to form a women's battalion, which they gave the wonderful name of the Woman's Battalion of Death. <laughs> They are a little scary. But they were meant to be scary, right? Now, the interesting thing, these women were trained. They were thrown into the fighting. I don't have statistics for you, but hundreds of them died in the war. But they were meant to be scary, not so much to the Germans on the other side of the trenches. They were meant to be scary to Russian manhood. Because they were essentially, this battalion was created to shame Russian man men back to the front, um, which it was not terribly effective at. <laughs> resulted in the revolution, among other things. Um, <laughs> uh, in, the, in the remainder of the armies, it's the British that came closest to anything that might be called militarizing women. In 1917, they formed the WAC, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which was created by the War Office under pressure from women. It was not part of the official army, so it was not a part of the army structure. But these women did have ranks. They were issued uniforms. They were largely under um, uh, military discipline, codes of discipline, while they served. And they listed, enlisted about 40,000 women into these positions. And again, they largely served in support positions for the army, laundry, cooking, that kind of thing. Um, but the, and it's not, I'm sorry it's not a great photograph, but that is a, a group of them parading in London before they went off to serve. And this vision of women parading in uniform also was deeply disconcerting to a population that was concerned about what was happening to traditional gender roles over the course of the war. In many ways, the governments of Europe sought to make sure that women did not confuse their priorities over the course of the fighting. So even as they hired tens of thousands of women into munitions uh, jobs, they were careful to call them temporary jobs. Or when they talked about women um, stringing shells, there were odes to them in the newspaper about how they could string them like pearls, you know, ways to feminize what they were doing. The French munitions worker, female munitions workers were referred to as the munitionettes, you know, the cute little female munitions workers. It made them seem less threatening. Um, but what they were mostly concerned about, and the particularly the French, who were always concerned about population numbers and demography, were that women did not forget that their primary role was as mothers, and particularly mothers to future soldiers and to future laborers. So the two examples of this type of propaganda that I brought to show you are picture postcards that circulated over the course of World War I. Of course, a lot of letter writing going on and postcard writing over the course of the war. So the postcard on the right, the vertical one there, the woman obviously is wearing a military helmet, evoking serve, military service to the nation. And it says on the placard, Allons, mesdames, travailler pour France. So let's go, ladies, work for France. And you can see by the picture on her placard what kind of work the government's calling for, right? Making babies and having children. Um, the horizontal postcard is my very favorite from the entirety of the war. So that one, you have the military um, cap from a gentleman, a soldier on leave. The um, piece of paper above it says permission de séjour, so that's for six days leave from the front to go visit his wife, presumably. And the words at the top say un bon coup de bayonet which is probably best translated into English as a good thrust. <laughs> so I leave it up to your imagination what kind of thrusting the government was uh, calling for during this man's leave. Um, so it's funny, but it points to something very, very real, which is the French were deeply concerned, as other nations were as well, that women would not forget their responsibility as mothers, um, and particularly once the war was over and they came back home. The war, I'd say if you picked up a history book 15 or 20 years ago, if it talked about women at all, it would talk about the importance of World War I in liberating women. That was a very common verb used to describe what happened to women at the end of World War I. And at least in one important way, it seemed like there was some pretty impeachable evidence to prove that was the fact, which is that women gained the votes 
In many countries of Europe, as well as in the United States, at the end or shortly after the end of World War I. Uh, this was true in Britain, as of the United States. It was true in the Scandinavian countries. It was true in the new Weimar Republic of Germany, in Poland, in Austria, in Czechoslovakia. Most of Northern and Central Europe um, in these new states that formed um, uh, gave women the vote in the constitutions that were formed. And certainly, for many feminists and suffragists who had fought in the war, this made sense. As a British suffragist had said, they were campaigning for the right to vote for heroines as well as heroes. These are women who had proved their value to the nation over the course of the war, and the least the nation could do was reward them with the vote and, and political participation. Um, and there's certainly some truth to that story. That said, not all women who um, uh, participated in this war received the vote at war's end. French women did not gain the vote. They would not do so until 1944. Um, Belgian women did not gain the right to vote. Italian women did not give, gain the right to vote. And even in Britain, where they did gain the right to vote, there was deep concern because of the depletion of the numbers of young men due to the war. There was deep concern that women would outvote men. So women were only allowed to vote from age 30 onward in order to make sure that there were more men voting than women. Um, so there were severe restrictions. And when it came to voting in Central Europe, most Central European historians will argue the primary impetus for giving women vote in those countries is that women in the 1920s and 30s were considered a reliable conservative voting bloc. And with a communist neighbor knocking on their door, they saw it as insurance against the rise of communist parties in their own countries. So it's not at all clear that political emancipation was due in any direct sense to all the sacrifice that women had made in fighting over the war. Um, so I'm not sure that political liberation matches. Um, economic liberation, certainly not. Almost all of those women that I showed you pictures of earlier, um, as soon as the war was over, they were released from their jobs. They were expected to give it up to those veterans who were returning home and needed, um, needed the employment. The only sector that remained feminized even after the war was over was the white collar service sector. But all those metal work jobs, all of those um, returned to men when the war was over. So just like the case of imperialism, it's not that World War I immediately and sweepingly rewrote gender rules around Europe, but it did change people's attitudes and mentalities and planted seeds of equality that continued to germinate throughout the remainder of the 20th century. And I think this, in the case of women, this can mostly be clear, most clearly be seen in the utter fascination with what was sometimes referred to as the modern woman, or the new woman, um, or in France, la garçonne, or sometimes in the United States, the flapper. This new woman of the 1920s who no longer wore a corset, who was not afraid to go out unchaperoned, who wore the new fashions that were being popularized by Coco Chanel and others that had arms and elbows and even shoulders exposed, that had ankles and knees exposed, that had a very flat line to them, the bobbed haircuts in the 1920s that made women appear more masculinized. And that would smoke? And that would smoke, absolutely would smoke in public. That's Marlena Dietrich that you see smoking there, but that was very much part of the image of the modern woman as well. Um, this book, La Garçon, that's up there was a bestseller in France in the early 1920s. For those of you who don't speak French, the word garçon means boy. So La Garçon is the girl boy, right? And it was a story of a young woman who engaged in sexual relations with unmarried, unmarried men. She was unmarried, she smoked, she drove her own car and um, was just a literary sensation and scandal in the 1920s. And then um, cabaret singers like Melina Dietrich, who almost always wore men's clothing on stage. Um, Josephine Baker, the African-American cabaret sensation of Paris in the 1920s, who wore short, short bottom haircuts, all helped to popularize this idea of the liberated woman who no longer depended on men or followed the social prescriptions of their parents. Now, 
It's tempting to think that all women in Europe in the 1920s put on short hair or short clothes, bobbed their hair, and went out smoking. And that was absolutely not the case. I don't want to leave you with that perception. But I also don't want you to think that the modern woman was just a Parisian or a Berlin or London phenomenon. And I want to tell you a story that comes out of my own research. Um, my book that I published a number of years ago now looks at education in France stemming from World War I, primary school teachers and the pacifism that infused their education after the war. And as part of this research, I went out and interviewed teachers. At that time, they were in their late 80s and 90s, but they had taught in the 20s, and some of them had been um, uh, students in the uh, early period after World War I as well. And one of these women, a woman by the name of Marguerite Soudre, who was 90 years old when I talked to her, told me the story of when she entered teacher training college in the Dordogne in France in, the 19, or in 1920 itself. The Dordogne was one of the poorest, most rural um, departments of all of France at that time. It's also one of the best for vacations, and if you want to know about that, come talk to me afterwards. But that's a different story. Um, very poor, very rural, and she remembers the day that she went to her teacher training college, women in their te late teens and 20s, and the first woman there to bob her hair, cover her short, showed up in school. And she happened to be the daughter of the local school inspector, which made it even more scandalous. And so they all walked into the classroom, utterly hushed and silent, couldn't wait to see what the headmistress was going to say about this woman. And the headmistress came before them in the classroom, and she looked out, and she said, Mademoiselle so-and-so, I see you have a new hairstyle today. She said, it's very attractive on you. But remember that when you leave my classroom, you're going to go out into a small village community, and you're going to have to win the respect and trust of the parents in that community. And I encourage you to think about how your mannerisms and how you look reflects on the teacher that you want to be. And I like that story because it's such a blending of tradition and modernity all at once in one of the most remote, remote corners of France. But it was not just Marlene Dietrich then that was challenging gender norms. It was women like the school teacher, like the women who rode bicycles, sometimes even in long pants, not in skirts, around the countrysides of Europe. Women like the, um, uh, the um, pacifists in this Photograph in 1920, who began meeting alongside the League of Nations, demanding women's representation in international um, political meetings as well, all of whom argued that women had a prominent place to play in the political and public lives of their countries. So how did the Great War change the world? Well, many, many ways that I didn't talk about today. But World War I, I want you to walk away believing, challenged racial and gender hierarchies worldwide, laying the seeds for the gradual democratization of states and societies in the 20th century. Thank you very much.